three, two, one. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Casey, the Campo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series where we talk to our Hall of Fame members and discuss Kempo, past, present, principles, concepts, their thoughts. These are the best of the best chosen by their peers. So our special guest today, we're very, very honored. I've been having a lot of conversations with him. Would you please welcome Mr. Todd Durgan. Todd, how you doing, buddy? Pretty good, sir. Thank you. I appreciate well, the opportunity. We're glad to have you here. And Todd, tell yes, us sir. a little bit about your background in the martial arts. Uh, well, I was um, about 10 or 11 when uh, a family friend, a uh, church friend actually, uh, was looking to go start a class and uh, his children were all too young and he didn't want to go do it himself uh, and I was fascinated with the martial arts so he invited me to go along and he was gracious enough to pay for my classes for a while so uh, I enjoyed that. It was in a little town outside of Yelm, Washington called Rainier in a school gym um, and my best recollection, best recollection was uh, that the guy was a Kempo teacher, but I have absolutely zero idea of who he was, uh, what line or anything else. But uh, all of my all of my recollections of the classes were of star block set type uh, sets, uh, some of the foot maneuvers and footwork uh, freestyles and stuff like that. So, and then uh, later on, uh, you know, a few years went by. We didn't get to do it uh, for very long, but a few years went by, and I got back into it. Uh, I started training with. Uh, a gentleman named Randy Borden, who is uh, actually a, a famous Hawaiian singer, or a somewhat famous Hawaiian singer, and uh, a very big man. Um, at one point, I believe Mr. Randy will attest to this, uh, he, uh, Mr. Randy ran into him in a martial arts store and had to do a double take because he thought he was Ed Parker. Uh, he was a he was a spitting image of Mr. Parker. So, uh, I, I guess, I guess, to some extent, you might say I got a little bit of time with somebody pretty close to Ed Parker and the way he moved, <laughs> his size and his ability. Uh, certainly wasn't Ed Parker, but it was uh, as close as I ever got. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, uh, he went away and I, I was training with uh, an Okinawan Kempo Karate guy uh, who trained in the Marines um, and uh, over in Okinawa was a high-ranking black belt. Trained with him for a couple of years in the in the interim while I was looking for another American Kempo uh, school and uh, the gentleman that owned the martial arts store who was one of Dave German's black belts um, finally finally he was so happy that Mr. Rainey was opening a studio that he uh, he got a hold of me and said hey you know go go see this guy because I I bugged him relentlessly I was like a thorn in his side trying to find an American Kempo guy and uh, he sent me to Mr. Rainey. And uh, that was uh, 1988 or 89, I believe. And uh, I've actually trained or been a student of Mr. Rainey's for all of this time since then. And you've always uh, trained in uh, Kempo? Uh, yeah, for the most part, yes. Uh, I've, I've dabbled and done other things uh, and studied other things, a lot of other things. But uh, American Kempo has been my primary art. Okay. Now, have you ever train in other systems or cross train since you've been in Kempo? Yeah, so I cross trained uh, quite a bit. Uh, some of the stick stuff, uh, collier knees and, stuff, and things like that. Um, my, my two and a half year stint between Randy Borden and, and AC Rainey were uh, spent, uh, like I said, studying Okinawan Kempo Karate. So it's a very hard linear style. It's a uh, very shur shurikan. Uh, you know, they do the pinons, uh, you know, um, and, and no, no self-defense techniques. It's just, you know, that you do bunkai for your forms and stuff like that. I see. And, and have you and have you applied any of the principles in your cross training to your Kempo? Uh, yes. And we'll get into that a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, that's part of our whole deal. Okay. So right. now so, let me ask you this, uh, Todd, why don't you explain how you came up with your new system, which is really not new, but you've been involved with this for some time, and what led to it? So uh, there were a lot of things along the way that, that kind of brought me to where I'm at now, as there are for anybody. Um, and it, 
to be clear, it's not, you know, a new system like people might think. This is something that I've been working on for, let's see, since, uh, well, formalizing since 2008. And, you know, obviously, you know, you work on this for your entire career. Um, but I had, I've had several students over the years say, you know, why are there, why is there so much separation between systems and styles? And so that was one of the things that kind of brought me there. And then, you know, my curiosity, I guess you, you would say is the thing that has brought me to where I'm at now more than anything. Uh, and again, I'm sure Mr. Rainey would attest to this. I, I'm, I am not an individual that, uh, is pro, uh, is, uh, going to sit by idly and just do what I've done always and do the same thing and continue to do it. I want to learn, progress, grow as an individual, as a martial artist. And in that, in that light, I wanted to be able to help my students past and present and future be able to come to a place where they have the ability and the capacity to defend themselves at a much sooner time in their journey in the arts if that makes sense. Sure it does. Can you, okay, so, so give us a name. How did you come up with the name? Face It Combatives. <laughs> so face, face It Combatives, and can you explain what that means? Yeah, so Face It Combatives, Face It, uh, face it is a short, is, I, I gave you the definition of that. It was, it's a short period, it's a, it basically it relates to, it means a short period of excitation to quickly deal with something, right? So Face It Combatives, and the combatives I spelled with a K because you know, combatives, just something to change it and make it kind of cool. Uh, and then uh, integrated, I actually borrowed from uh, uh, Dave German's system name, which is ty uh, Transitional Arts Integrated, I believe, right? And because I, I was actually fond of, of Dave German's uh, kind of methodology, the way he put things together. Uh, I appreciated uh, the Nawaza and a lot of the things, um, and so so the so the name Face It Combat is integrated, and I did intentionally leave out, which may upset or may not upset some people. I intentionally left out the Kenpo, and I intentionally left out Karate, because I did not want it to be something that was um, uh, seen as this one generic thing or one. Uh, you know, one or we pigeonholed into something because it does have uh, groundwork, it does have joint locks, it does have niwaza, it does have china, it has small circle jujitsu, and it also has, um, you know, the karate. Okay, uh, and you're you're giving us some background, and is this something you just developed uh, because of the other influences, or is just something that just came to you one night? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing comes one night other than ice cream, right? If you say so. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's really been, it's really been more, I mean, the journey and the process has happened through, um, through the process of writing the book, uh, right, uh, putting together the, the posters and, and exploring what I see and what I know as Kempo. And, and really, uh, you know, uh, disassembling the art of Kempo and then reassembling it to delve into and understand the principles and the concepts, the, you know, all the forms and techniques, you know, you go through the infinite insights and you guys have been talking about on the art of war, uh, and, you know, and, and, and just to better understand the things that Mr. Parker left behind for us to have and to use as tools of study and tools of teaching and tools of, of practice. So you come up with this concept. Was this an extension of something you read in the Infinite Insights? Um, no, it's probably more caused by some of the comments that Mr. Parker had. Like, uh, you know, he talked about, I hope that people use these things that I've given you, these tools and these concepts and principles to further uh, you know, uh, uh, promote and develop the art or their art, you know, and, and the reality of it is, is that, you know, it's, look, we're all on an individual journey and it's our, it's our art. I know that, uh, many of the seniors have talked about how 
so, it, you know, all the seniors have said, you know, uh, that, you know, everybody here does their own art. Uh, Ed Parker did Ed Parker Campo. So anyway, so I think it was page 258, he, he mentions that, uh, and in other places too, there are many places in many of his books where he talks about taking the things that he's done and the things that he's given and, and you know, going forward with your own uh, ideas and concepts and growing and, and promoting and propagating the art. Okay. Uh, I, I'm i going to reference one of the books because you have really expanded upon the universal pattern in your book publications that you've read you've written a couple of books actually actually i've only written i've only finished one i finished the first one which was uh constituents of contact manipulation um it's not exactly a new york's time new york times bestseller but it's you know few people have gotten it and even fewer read it uh if you, <laughs> if you ask my wife it's a math book but uh you know it is somewhat geometry and so forth so that book covers, um, goes through, I do cover a little more in depth and I say more in depth and don't misunderstand when I say that. I'm not saying that I know the universal pattern pattern or better than or have any idea what Mr. Parker's idea was for the universal pattern other than what I've uh, read in book four and seen from his diagrams. But I tried to expand on that and give uh, some logical history of the universal pattern where some of those elements come from, for example, from the, from the, uh, the medical field with the transverse coronal and sagittal planes, the dissection of the human anatomy, et cetera. And then I talk about levers and leverage, uh, talk about the four basic elements of levers and leverage in chapter three. And then we go into concepts of takedowns, throws. We go into concepts of, um, uh, uh, pressure points, uh, and then we go into sequence rescripting, which is something that I put together as a term to describe and define what many people do, but don't exactly call it that. So it's just my own term for something that lots of people do. You know, it's interesting in our discussions uh, we've had here, Todd, uh, in volume four of uh, Mental and Physical uh, constituents of Mr. Parker, he goes into the universal pattern, talks mm -hmm. about it from page 161 up to 180. And there is one page, 168, page 168, where he makes a reference to two different things related pretty much to the same idea. One is planes and the others are angles. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have made it a really important part to reference more to the planes than the angles. And I understand in talking with you what that means, but I would like you to explain it to our guests that are watching how you've developed that and how you use it in your teaching. So, and this is, a, this is in my mind, a very crucial and important part of the teaching process. Uh, angles one is one of the elements of the uh, analytical study of motion. Okay, An that's where angles comes from, and that's why it's relevant. But I can talk angles all day and say 45 degrees, 90 degrees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The universal pattern has specific. Okay, every plane is on a specific angle relative to your center line, and if you if you start a student understanding that and understanding what those planes are and what angles that they are at 45 degrees or 90 degrees or whatever uh, then it's an easier journey for them to visually see and execute and have a visual aid to uh, follow those particular angles without even having to actually tell them it's 45 degrees to your right or 45 degrees to your left because if i tell a student who and, it, and, and my students from the day they walk in my studio, they start, they're introduced to my posters with the universal pattern, the levers, the leverage, the methods of execution, the collier knee stuff. And so I immediately start them on that journey with, you know, what are the, what are the master key planes? That's a favorite Kempo term that everybody likes to use is master key this and master key that. Well, so I put that into, the planes and it's the master key planes are one, two, and three. That's because those are the three planes that come directly from the field and the dissection of the human anatomy, height, depth, and width. 
because we're three dimensional. Okay, so let's walk through these planes. <clears throat> okay, so you have the you have the master key planes one, two, three. Pretty simple. Okay, one is the transverse plane which dissects your height. It's the horizontal plane. So all of your footwork that you maneuver on or move on when you move, and, and this is the majority of the footwork, is on a number one plane. Okay, you're moving horizontally. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? That is not limited just to the footwork, correct? It can move up the complete height of the individual, correct? correct. Uh, so it yeah, can be well, that's, at, that's, at that's footwork, a little... knee, waist, chest, eyesight, correct? Correct. Okay, would, let me sure I clear that up. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll get to we'll get to the whole tunnel vision and the tube and the cylinder in a minute. Okay. Mr. Parker has that drawn on, on in his uh, book in the breakdown of the universal pattern. So we'll get back to that. So plane, so plane one is horizontal uh, and, and it's modifiers, okay? And what I mean by modifiers is that when you look at the universal pattern, we have one, two, and three, they're all perpendicular and 90 degrees from each other, okay? Plane two is dissects the, the depth, plane three dissects the width, okay? So plane two is the coronal plane, plane three is the sagittal plane. Those are medical terms, and the reason that I use those medical terms is so that people can look, they can actually reference that and research it. I'm not making it up. I did the reference, I did the research before I referenced it. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that is confusing about the way Mr. Parker laid out the universal pattern in book four, okay, is that, is that, Oh, my computer, hold on, my computer is, why is it doing that? Okay, um, in book four is that he has that, uh, that little ball that Junior drew. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Junior, uh, Ed Parker Jr. Did the, did the graphic, the animation, the illustrations, okay, that shows all nine planes in this little magic sphere, which is a solid version of this. So you see all of those in a solid view. I told you I was going to show you this. Um, that's a 3D printed universal pattern. So, so what happens is, is if it sets all of those pictures over one and it doesn't give you the view of the one, two, and three on top and then line everything up below to put them into a, into a, uh, a sensible sequence, okay? So that you have one, six, and nine, two, four, and seven, and I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> one, four, seven, two, five, eight, and then six, nine, uh, three, six, and nine. They're in threes, right? And so when I, when I went back, as I was going through this and I put together so that I could do some seminars, I rearranged that, that artwork so that they fell in line and it looks like, uh, basically it looks like a toe board. You know, three, three, and three. Um, so when I teach the students, I teach them the first plane, horizontal. Second plane divides the, you know, because you teach your students a, a neutral bow, which has height, depth, and width. If you, if you show them the planes to coincide with that, then they can understand that height, depth, and width and how it works. Then you can start to show them the diagonals to those master key planes and give them those angle references. We're going through the planes and you have nine planes, correct? Correct. Okay, so you've got the planes and you're going in through the planes. Why don't you explain how they relate to one another? Okay, so uh so the the like I said, the number the number one plane is is horizontal, and every every master key plane has its diagonals. And this is important because diagonal motion translates differently to the human brain. When, when affected by diagonal motion, it has a different uh, result than when affected by uh, something longitudinal, latitudinal, or vertically, okay? Because your brain deciphers it differently. So when we look at the number one plane, for example, and we roll that up or down 45 degrees, that down is the number four plane, okay? and the up is the number seven plane. And so it gives you the diagonal of the number one, the diagonal planes or versions 
of the number one plane. And then when we go to the number two plane, which is actually on the sides, okay, dissects your depth, and we spin that right or left 45 degrees, then you get your number five plane on the left, number, right, number eight plane on the right, which again is the diagonal to the number two plane. The number three plane being in your center, dissecting width of body, when it's rotated right or left, it gives you your six or your nine, now, which is diagonal to the number three plane. Now, does this relate in the circumference of, in your, in your bubble, so to speak, you're in this, uh, this cylinder, is there a front half, is there a back half reference? In other words, you had talked about a quadrant in the zone theories. <laughs> so, so zone theories is Mr. Parker's. Well, a quadrant zone theory is Mr. Parker's, right? Right. So to, answer, so to answer your question, yes, there's there's a front half and a back half. There's a right half and a left half. Right. If you look at the if, if you look at the zone theory or the quadrant zone theory, you have, uh, and in the book I talk about quadrant zone theory as it relates to uh, overlaying the universal pattern. So in each quadrant, you now have you can now imp impose or implement an additional universal pattern, it, or at each joint where it articulates, you can, you can add another nine planes. So it really, that's a rabbit hole. I mean, that's a, that's a rabbit hole, right? So we're not going down that rabbit hole right now, right, Todd? No, we're not, we're not going down you. that rabbit hole. I, uh, I, I suggest our viewers, if you really want to explore this, you pick up a copy of his manual. And I'm telling you, once you read through it, you're going to have more questions, but they will be helpful to you. So let's talk about the major elements of motion and how it relates to in your planes. Maybe you want to address that. Give me what your definition of major elements of motion. Well, you had it as path and angle, direction, dimension, method, et cetera. Et cetera. Oh, that's oh, the uh, analytical study your, of motion. Words. Yeah. Analytical study of motion. Yes, that's sir. What that's what I was referring to was the analytical study of motion. So you have direction, path dimension, angle, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I'm off the top of my head, I forget what the fifth one is. It's okay, we can read it in the book. Uh, yeah, right. So, yeah, speaking It's of okay, that. I've got it. Let's go, let's go on here. So you were talking about <clears throat> on the first plane with footwork. How is the footwork defined when it comes to kicks? How is it defined? Yeah. By what? Well, you had it listed as how the planes were used. So I'm, maybe I'm into a different plane. Maybe it's plane two. But I thought it was in plane one that was a reference to kicks as being exaggerated footwork. Okay, so if kicks are an exaggerated footwork, that's true. But not all kicks travel on a, on a horizontal plane or number one. A front snapping ball kick, for example, moves up the center line, travels center line, so it's going to move on a number three plane, right? Mm -hmm. uh, kick ideal an ideal roundhouse kick travels on a horizontal plane to if it's going to meet its target on a perpendicular angle or as mr parker says the uh proper angle of incidence right okay okay so <clears throat> so that plane changes okay and is relative to the center line of your body of the person executing so no not all kicks move on a horizontal plane uh side kicks not going to or an or on a number one plane, they can travel on a, on any plane that that you're using to meet or match or get to the target. So we've covered pretty much the basics of the planes as you've defined them at this point. Let's Very go to basic, the next yes. level, which you've developed was recognizing levers and leverage. I, it's very fascinating. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. I know there's you have three different classes. Uh, and then they're how they're implemented, how they're used in the and applied against in Ed Parker's techniques. So let's walk through the levers and the leverage concept. Okay, so so levers and leverage is obviously not new. Levers leverage is one of the oldest known tools to man. Okay, and I talk about that. I made a joke about that in the book actually about the old. The old adage about the caveman knocking a girl out and dragging her back to his cave. And that, that action or that motion of doing that employs a particular class of lever. So if we talk about levers and leverage, though, and this is the thing, and one of the reasons that I, that I spent the time 
and took the time to expound on that and put it in the book and include it in the book was that it's very seldom ever actually recognized in its basic elements. And as Kempoists, we have this tendency to just demolish something down to its most basic elements and then bring it back up to its more sophisticated, uh, you know, some more sophisticated form. So, you know, every, every class of lever, there are three classes of levers and then there are compound levers, but every class of lever has four basic elements. And those four basic elements, I'm sure some of you have heard this, four basic elements, effort, load, fulcrum, and lever the lever itself or the action line. It's sometimes it's easier to understand it if you refer to it as an action line. That's the that's the the binding agent of the other three elements. How did you come upon this to be used in Kempel principles? So I I, I was very fortunate. I got to go to a Remy Prasis and a Wally J combination seminar. Sweet, I mean opportunity of a lifetime. It was really cool. Um, Wally Jay is a phenomenal martial artist, was a phenomenal, uh, you know, creator of his system. And, but the, but the, but the thing that I found, and this is not to discredit Wally Jay at all, was that he was not able to define or explain fully what leverage was. He was, he would, he would teach you something. He'd say, it's just, it's this, it's this, just do this. And he was motioning with his wrist. Um, and so uh, when I left, I, I was inspired to research and understand, you know, better what leverage is. And so I came back, I found some books, read up on it, looked at it, and then and looked around and realized that very little, if any, and to be, to be truthful, nobody that I knew of or had ever met was actually uh, explaining leverage in a very basic form or, or to, you know, the four elements of leverage. I'd never gotten that from anybody. So maybe that's just me. Maybe I wasn't listening to the lesson, but I didn't, I didn't see it anywhere. You know, and I, yeah, you know, I'm the first one to admit, I don't know everything. So I, I set out on a, on a journey and a, down a path to, you know, better understand and define and, and explain this for myself and for my students, you know, and in that process, and, and that's kind of how the process of the book came about, writing the book was that as I went through these different things to understand them for myself and to be able to teach them for my students, um, you know, I just kind of started compiling all of these things and then at some point I had you know, all this stuff. Yeah, so Todd's stuff. <laughs> all this stuff. It. <laughs> A little <laughs> humor there, Todd's stuff. Okay, well, Todd, it is time to explain each of those four in a simplistic way that we can understand. Help us. Okay, so, so you have a, a fulcrum, effort, load, and lever. The fulcrum is the pivot point or the axis. And every one of these has you can you can call it one or two thing one or two different things with with regard to the nomenclature. So the fulcrum is the pivot point or the axis. The effort is that uh, that um, energy that is being expended to move something. Okay, whether it be you know a grab and a pull, a push, or or whatever it may be, to affect something on the other side of the fulcrum from the from the effort. Okay, and which is going to be the load. So the body you want to move, the neck you want to wrench, the wrist you want to turn, uh, or the, the person you want to throw as a result of a wrist lock, the sweep you want to employ. Okay, so those are your, so you have first, second, and third class. First class is like that of a teeter-totter or a seesaw. The second class is like a wheelbarrow where you have, and, and it's, it's kind of funny when you look at these uh, with regard to application in joint locks, because they are almost invisible sometimes to the actual class that they are. Okay, so when I say a class two lever is a, like a wheelbarrow, go ahead. I was going to say, now what is third one? Because you uh, already explained I mean, number one and two. So, so a third class, well, that's why, but I wanted to preface it with that it's sometimes they're almost invisible. 
in their in their uh, in identifying them to their application. So the third class lever is like a hammer or sh or can be like a shovel. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So let's go over number one and give us some examples that our our viewers can understand through techniques in the Kempo world. Well, and so that gets us back to the whole hidden thing. So in the grasp of death, for example, when you uh, when you uh, you hook an anchor, okay? When you do that hook and anchor, that's a particular class of lever, okay? And then when you drop in and you execute that, uh, well, now it depends on if you're doing pinch of death, uh, uh, the pincher or the grasp of death. So the grasp of death comes in, I teach it with a tiger's mouth strike, this is the way I learned it, with a tiger's mouth strike to the back of the leg or to the tibial, okay? And that's kind of something I covered in nerves and pressure points in the, in the book. Um, and then, and that employs another particular class of lever. And then you go into the arm off and down, and that employs another particular class. Lever. And then you go to the trap, and that's another class of lever. So you have four or five or six instances in this technique where you're applying different various classes of levers, or the same, or one or two of the same or different. Okay, so what are they, you say? Well, I'm going to let you guys think about that. The Dance of Death does, does that as well. And these are examples of where first class lever is, okay? Uh, you have twisted twig, squatting sacrifice. Now you may ask yourself, squatting sacrifice, where in the world is a first class lever? Remember I said it's like, an, like a teeter-totter. Teeter-totter, correct. Or seesaw. So in squatting sacrifice, when you step off and you drop on the leg and they start to go down and you reach down and you grab that leg and lift it up, okay? If you think about how that's working, you're creating a first class lever. You're pulling that foot up causing the knee to go into the back of your leg or your buttocks, however you teach it or do it, okay? And that connection to your buttocks or your leg with their knee, that's the axis, that's the pivot point, okay, or the fulcrum. Mm -hmm. Your effort in pulling up their foot, that is the effort, okay? And then their body is obviously the load. There's your first class lever. Okay. But before you get to that, before you get to that, as you drop down and press down on their quad and cause their foot to go into the ground to, to, to um, uh, I'm sorry, anchor into the ground and connect to the ground, and you cause their body to start to tip back as you're pressing down on this leg, that's your third class lever, okay? Because now you have the, now you have the fulcrum, the effort, and the load, mm -hmm. okay? And so those, those elements change places and positions as you move from one class to the other. In the past, I've watched some of your videos and you've used some examples like that of Mace of Aggression, Triggered Salute, Glancing Salute, et cetera, et cetera. Can you explain briefly how some of the levers work in those techniques? So it, 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 in, in what, Triggered Salute? Yeah, you, you, you have interest on in that because you used it, a lot of people teach it linear. And then you were using a different, you use one of your different planes. I really like that. Why don't you explain that to us? Okay, so, so when we talk about, but, it, but it's like anything else in Kempo. When we talk about, you know, I'm using this and I'm using this. When I, you know, if I'm using levers and leverage and I'm trying to control and manipulate a person, I want to also employ things that, it, that add to that and help with that control and manipulation. So, we see a lot of people just execute that, you know, they'll come with the heel palm and they'll drop that down and it's very linear. And then they come up and they do the elbow or they come under, then do the elbow. If we use that and what that does is that causes that face to fold forward into your body. But if we execute that third class lever, okay. And it's a third class lever because I have the, I have the fulcrum here and I'm coming down on the inside of their elbow, just like we did with the knee and squatting sacrifice. And I'm moving or causing to move their body. That's the load. So that's a third class lever. So when I do that, and I see Sammy's thinking about that, uh, when we do that, we, we, uh, we then start that head to come forward. But if I, but if I change the act of the line of action from a number three plane or number, it's actually a number seven plane because it's coming downward diagonally. It's a number seven plane in number three direction. If I change that now, to a number nine plane, it causes a tip in the axis of my opponent, okay? And it takes their head away from me and enables me to preload my elbow strike back to their body, 
which can be an accelerated move as well. Exactly. No different than snapping twig when you come in and accelerate into the elbow. Okay, very cool. One thing I just want to remind people on the planes, they have a starting point and an ending point, which can be different, which it really helps clear up the question of angles. So when you say that, it's an easier reference, correct? Correct. Okay, good. Okay, so let's. Uh, so do most of the of the levers? Do you find that to be uh, in grappling a aspects of of Kempo techniques that are with grappling, or can they just be also be used in a striking technique? So anything that you do employs levers and leverage because that's how the body is designed. You're mechanically you're mechanically designed or built. Uh, employing levers and leverage, just the action of my hand closing is employing some form of lever. It's typically a third class lever where we have, you know, extensors and flexors. Okay. Uh, striking, so the striking applications do also uh, employ levers and leverage, um, but it's different. It's, Explain it's, the difference then. Well, because, because that's a result of your body doing something, uh, not the result of an interaction. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But you can explain that further if you like. That's it. That's what I got. I'm not. I'm not. Grabbing, <laughs> you got. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not grabbing. I'm not grabbing a wrist and manipulating a finger or a neck or a, you know I'm punching and that punch happens as a result of of a series of levers and leverage happening down up and down the, the arm as a result of tendons and ligaments pulling and pushing around the joints. Okay, Mr. Parker, use long kimono as both an offensive and defensive uh, technique. Can you compare and contrast on that? On the, okay, uh, so Lone Kimono em employs, does employ uh, leverage to the arm break or control, whichever you decide to do, and the clear, if you decide to clear it or if you decide to keep it. Uh, how that happens is because we, once we do the trap, then we then execute or we acquire the fulcrum for the action right okay. and then when we drop back and extend that arm then we then we elongate the target right we elongate the lever the, the action line and we break it thus causing the body to move okay so that's a third class lever i see so our first lever we look at that is a teeter-totter or the seesaw is two right? is the wheelbarrow and mm -hmm. three is more like the hammer or that of the shovel. Correct. Correct. Those are the examples that you gave. I just want to remind our, our, our viewers here that that's what we're talking about and how mm -hmm. you've moved the points there and then the effects of that. Right. Yeah. So the, the fulcrum, the axis, and the load change. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. The fulcrum, the effort, and the load change. Okay. Positions. You know, they, they juxtaposition to acquire a different uh, class of lever. Can this apply also to weapons? Absolutely. It, it absolutely applies to weapons. Um, call you screaming, and that's one of the things that makes a club or a, or a knife so dangerous because of the applied leverage to the striking uh, and, and the power acquisition with a weapon. I see. Do you have any plans of uh, exploring that as well in future books, the use of these? With regard uh, to what? Well, with weapons. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of touched on it in book one. Uh, book two is I'm working on it. Uh, I'm not sure how diligently I'm going to continue to work on it, but it's an ex it's more of an expansion of book one for to answer questions that I've gotten at seminars and just in general. People come up and say, hey, I uh, don't understand, or man, that's a tough read, or... Uh, you know, what did you mean by this? And so kind of go, you know. What is your, what's your, what are you working on right now? Um, trying to finalize my, um, the teaching uh, manual for the phasic combative system. Okay. <clears throat> and I mean, I, I, you know, the book thing is a love hate thing for me. <laughs> because uh it, you're not it's, the reader <laughs> it, what's, that? what's that i said you're not the one reading it going what the heck 
I'm well, yeah, to I know. This out. All of a sudden, the phone's going to start ringing on you, Todd. <laughs> so, so it, so it's kind of a love hate thing for me having having um, you know it, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of uh, time to make sure that the information that you're putting in those books or that book is 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 many things, but the most important thing is that it's going to be understandable and it's going to be valuable to the reader. It's going to have value for the reader. And, you know, I, I just, I look, sometimes I go back and I read a chapter and I ask myself, well, you know, does that really add value to this conversation? Is that really at, you know, so it's a, it's a process. I mean, like I told you, you know, I spent 14 years writing the first book and it's only 150 some pages, I think, you know, many of those years was contemplating whether or not it added value to the conversation and, or would help anybody along the way. If you ever have a chance to attend one of his seminars, I strongly recommend it. But Todd, why don't you tell people how they can get your manual, your book, so that they can further develop their learning uh, based on your principles? Well, I know a few of these people on here already have it, but for those that don't know or don't have it, it is on Amazon or it's on my website, at kempoguy.com. Mr. Ashmore's got an original copy there. I went through a, a second version of it where I changed a few things around before I put it in an ebook. But it is also on ebook, uh, paperback, um, and then the, the posters that I did are actually on my website as well. Okay, before we go off into that Q&A, you brought it up to me. You wanted to discuss a little bit about Mr. Parker's Eight Considerations, which was enumerated in Volume 1 of Infinite Insights. What are your thoughts or, or your opinions or your comments that you wanted to bring up? Well, I just, I, I, you know, I, I sat in on the uh, art of war for a while and it's, it seems to, the eight considerations seems to be this kind of hotbed or hot topic. Um, and I think that uh, it's important for people to understand and this, and I bring this up because I am at fault for this, you know, that, that we don't be complacent with regard to our research or, or with regards to our, um, you know, where we draw things from. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you know I was listening to the to the to the the uh, the Zoom meetings and the whole conversation about uh, the eight considerations, and so I you know I flipped open my you know my my infinite insights are up on a shelf, and I have to move a couple books to get to one of them, and so I just grabbed my my encyclopedia real quick and opened it up, and I looked at it, and I'm like, wait a minute, these are different than the other eight considerations that they're talking about on the Zoom meeting, and I had forgotten. Uh, you know, that, you know, uh, in book one on, I think it's page 101 or wherever he, he covers those in depth, uh, you know, that the first consideration is acceptance. And I have an opinion about acceptance and. Please tell us then, what is your opinion? Well, so, so the thing about acceptance is this, I think that we need to understand that, you know, it, it, there's a fine line between accepting something and understanding that it, you know, and, and what Mr. I think, what Mr. Parker is saying that, look, accept that something's going to happen, but I don't think that you need to accept that it has to happen to you. You know, I don't think you need to accept getting your ass kicked. I don't think you need to accept, you know, the worst. I think you need to accept the, uh, accept that something's going to happen. Beyond that, everything else is up to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we discussed this in our previous meeting, you and I, my thoughts on that, but we will not address that right now. Let's get off to asking some questions of our, our viewers here. And so I'm going to ask you to unmute your microphone. When I do, uh, please uh, say hello to Mr. Durgan and ask him a question that you think you have regarding some of the material that he's been discussing or your interest or something. But this is really to stimulate more dialogue, because you'll ask a question, and that might stimulate somebody else to think of a question, or we'll see how that plays out. So let's go down the line right now, and the first person out of the box is Greg Hildebrand. How you doing, Greg? Thank you. Welcome, Thank sir. You. Hey, what is, why don't you talk to Todd here for a few seconds? M Mr. Durgan, sir, uh, I, I have to admit, I'm kind of cheating here. I have your book on the other screen here. Uh, and I ordered, I ordered it after the, the, the Zoom meeting about the uh, 
comparison with uh, Art of War. Uh -huh. I saw that you had the book, and I've been meaning to order it. So I finally ordered it, and I've consumed about 60% of the book already. Briefly, <laughs> it's one of those things going to take five or six reads to really absorb. So, right. but my question, I'm going to be cheating here a little bit. My question was involving the levers. What, 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 I'm, I'm curious about the difference, between, say, between uh, long kimono and snapping twig, where long kimono, you want to maintain hyperextension and not break it so you don't lose a lever, where in snapping twig, you're actually getting the first part of the lever result and then snapping it to, to continue. So, I mean, what would you, what is your perspective on the differences of the two involving your levers section? Of so there, so the, the lever is, I, and that's a great question. The lever is the same, right? The lever is the same, although I have to say, it depends on at what point in snapping twigs and at what point in the push are you applying the strike to the elbow? Okay, because if you if you catch that hand as it comes in before it actually touches or grabs, and you and you apply that, now you've got something different than if you trap it and break it and then come in. Does so like sense? you don't you don't establish the fulcrum yet. Correct. You haven't established the fulcrum. What actually happens there is that the fulcrum is actually on the other end in their shoulder. Oh, right? I see. Now that's interesting. Because that's the that's where the stability is. So okay. you have to look where the stability is, okay, and then you can then you can look at where the effort and the uh, uh, and the load are. Because that's the load, be, load becomes see the load becomes the elbow. You're breaking the elbow, uh -huh. right? When which, you, on which end is delivered? All right, well the energy is compounded. Correct. It, it's because you're breaking it. Now in long kimono, if you did the same thing, if you broke it, right, you applied that, you applied that same class of lever, okay, a third class lever, you're applying that same class of lever and the lever dies or goes away once you break it. So right. that's one of the reasons it's important when you're uh, working joint locks and manipulations, it's very important that you don't work it at striking speed, which is what most people do. One of the first things I always talk about when I do a seminar on, on uh, levers and leverage or con uh, contact manipulation is that we as Kempoists, you know, we have this propensity to, to just move as quickly as possible, striking and power and so on and so forth. And, and when we get to this aspect, we have to be very cautious about what it is that we're doing and very uh, aware of, of the safety of our partner and opponent. So, so would you recommend say, so like with me, I, 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 I see that, Long kimono is more of a contouring type of move where you can work that control manipulation and get that sensitivity for control, right? And then right. snap between is more of a ballistic striking move, right? Right. So so let me ask you this. Where do you see what do you see as applying the lever the le leverage? What part of your body is applying? How is the leverage? What are the points of connection that make that a first, second, or third class lever? Which you know? one? Long kimono? Yeah. Kind of confused about the question, to be honest with you. Okay, I, I so mean, I'll just, I've just, I'll just got into it a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to see it through your eyes, you know. Yeah. So, so it, what I meant by that is, is what are the, you know, you have the four components or the four elements of leverage, and right. what, what are those connections to you, and what is the, what is the line, the action line, and what is, you know, so. I'll, I'll help you out with my question because okay, I'm getting your action line, right? Right. So their arm, their arm is only the action line as long as you're manipulating them. Okay. Okay. But you have two in, in lone kimono because your because your arm is also applying leverage. Okay. okay. You have an effort, you have a fulcrum and you have them as the load. So, yes. so that's a compound lever situation. I get it. That makes sense. Excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, can I cheat and ask one more real quick? Sure, go ahead. Oh, because I'm really into his book a little bit too much, I think already. So, so I'm reading the section where you talk about inclined planes versus wedges. <laughs> the reason the, the reason why it attracts me is because I worked with Paul Mills for the last 25 years, and entering we work a lot of entering wedges. We work wedges a lot, and uh, we've learned the value of the wedging especially on the entry. 
So I'm a little confused. I guess I'm not, I'm having trouble translating that one section there and it feels like a hole for me in the book is something I need to go back to. So could you explain what you mean by the incline planes versus wedges? Okay, so, well, and, uh, okay, first of all, real simple. A wedge is two inclined planes. Oh, I see, okay, I get you. That, that fixed, yeah. it just snapped like that. Yeah, okay, I knew you'd be able to clear that up. Thank you very much, I appreciate your time. Thank My you, pleasure. Greg, I really appreciate you coming on. Let's go to Billy. Billy Nicewanger, are you there, sir? Why don't you say hello to Mr. Durgan? Yes, hello, sir. Mr. Nicewanger, how you doing, buddy? Doing well, sir. How are you? Good. So uh, my question, just kind of as, uh, you know, you and I have discussed extensively regarding this, um, but just kind of for the group a little bit, is in reference to the specific um, PKI um, system or FASIC combatives integrated, I was curious as to um, what you would have as an answer to someone who might say, well, there's so much less material here in reference to like the original Kempo system and un understanding that they're two different systems. But, you know, if someone from the original Kempo system is were to be coming over to it, being like, well, where am I getting some of these, you know, toolbox and attributes and stuff like that, that um, for various techniques that, you know, you don't no longer have listed here. Where am I building these skills from a student stand base? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Billy. What do you absolutely. say about that, Todd? So, so Mr. Nicewanger, to be fair, is one of my black belts who trained with me through. Well, that wasn't a very co fair question then. What the hell? Through, through, yeah, but, but he's, but he's not a, he's not a, he has not gone through the face of combative system. He's okay. a, you know, traditional Parker Kempo black belt, as far as traditional goes. So, <clears throat> so to answer the question, you know, basically what he's saying is, hey, where do I get all this other stuff that the Ed Parker system has that, that face of combatives doesn't have? Uh, and <clears throat> um, so the reality of it is, is that what I did when I, when I removed a bunch of the techniques from my curriculum, I went through and I removed the techniques that were, in my opinion, uh, big brother, big sister, or family related techniques that have Yes, they have additional attributes that the base techniques don't have, or master key techniques don't have. But what I've done is I've, uh, in addition to teaching those after black and phasic combatives, what I've done is I've added attributes to the end of techniques. So, for example, uh, a, a yellow belt when they learn uh, delayed sword at the end of delayed sword, which I don't call it delayed sword. I renamed everything to stay away from the cam four uh, debacle. Um, when, once they learn delayed sword and they have it, and then they go into their next techniques, then I teach them attributes. And the attributes consist of either small circle jiu-jitsu, uh, some kind of judo throw or takedown, uh, all of these other systems, you know, uh, some collier knees, so on and so forth. So delayed sword at the end of that has a particular attribute that teaches a very simple wrist lock control. And that's it. So at the end of their technique, they do this, they do this attribute. And then as time progresses and as they learn the system and as they acquire more of the material, then they're expected to start in implementing those attributes at any point in the technique, not just at the end of the technique, and start to see and learn where they are relative to other techniques within the system. Brian Duffy, hello, how are you doing, sir? I'm gonna mute you, why don't you say hello to Mr. Durgan? This will be interesting. Mr. Duffy, how are you doing, sir? Good, Todd, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. I haven't seen you in a while. Okay, I have a question for you. Uh, uh -oh. In your research, uh, what class of lever have you found to be most prevalent in the Kempo techniques, and can you cite some examples for us? Third class lever. Third class lever is, is the most prevalent in uh, throws and takedowns, for example, in uh, um, uh, the grasp of death, for example, where we're, we're it, well, okay, so I have to, huh, it depends on how you're applying it, actually. Okay. Uh, it, you know, it's funny because, you know, I say that and then I think about seminars that I've taught and I've watched people applying joint locks and stuff. So they, they each have their, they each have their purpose and their category. Um, 
second class levers are for second class levers basically uh, are used for trapping, choking, grabbing, pinning, and striking. Okay, so we say striking, but uh, you know the strike for the the use of a second class lever for striking is very uh, not convoluted, but very discreet and very hard to find. Because if you think about striking somebody with a wheelbarrow and hitting them with the actual barrel of the wheelbarrow, that's a difficult concept to comprehend, isn't it? Sure. Yes. <laughs> if I if I look at if I look at the the tech let's look at the technique sleeper or if I look at a gi choke okay if I take if I put my hand across somebody's shoulder across their face like my left arm is right now and I grab their shoulder and I grab that that uniform and I slam my forearm into their neck or their head okay that becomes a second class strike because I've put that in the middle of the fulcrum and the effort. Does that make sense? Right. So I know I didn't answer your question, but I will, t I I will say in my opinion, in my research and in doing uh, this, third class lever is typically the most common, commonly found application of leverage in the Kempo system. Thank you, Brian. Let's move on over to Derek Hibb. And Derek, how you doing? I'm going to unmute you. Hello, Derek. Say hello, hello. to Brian Durkin. How are you, Mr. Durkin? Very good, Mr. Hibb. How are you doing? Um, well, thank you. Uh, tuned in just a little bit late getting home. Had to help Dad finish up some knives today. So uh, I caught the, the last 35 minutes or so, and you, you've definitely got my attention. And... Uh, don't really so much have a question uh, as much as uh, I really like to check out your book and your theories and uh, look forward to uh, hopefully gaining some new insight. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Please yeah. say hello to your father and your brother for us and, yeah. and to uh, everyone over in the Hibben family. Let's move on down here and let's go to uh, Doug Poe. Doug, are you there? That's Alaska Doug. So uh, I am Alaska Doug, as, as some folks know me. Um, I had a whole bunch of questions, we'll and uh, you guys started uh, answering them all. So um, <laughs> it's just probably good I was muted because I'm one of those guys that just loves to get in there and ask questions while people there are talking. There has to be something, a comment. I, and I do, and my comment is I, I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Durden, Durden about, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about seven years ago, um, and uh, it, it could have just been sooner than that, but I uh, was pleased to accept a copy of his book uh, at that time and did read it. My, my question that uh, you kind of alluded to a little earlier, but I think it had to do with the, with the PKI uh, system, was what prompted you to decide you wanted to write a book on constituents of contact manipulation, and then um, how did that progress? Thank you, Doug. Uh, okay, so so in addition to so as I was I was you know my thing is is I, I always I always spend time researching. You can ask my wife; it drives her crazy. Um, I research a lot of stuff. I I mean I am I'm not just a mat guy. I love being on the mat and I love pounding on people, asking any of my students. Um, but I also want to understand better. Uh, with regard to the science and the physics. Kempo is actually an applied science and physics. So we must, in my opinion, spend time understanding those physics and that science. So I was compiling notes, ultimately, uh, compiling notes, compiling notes. And in 1996, I'm sorry, 1997, uh, Mr. Hebler, Grandmaster Hebler came to one of the United Kempo Systems uh, camps where I was teaching and uh, he asked if he could be my assistant and uh, and after my class uh, he asked me if I had any of the material written so that he could put it or include it in a book he was working on at the time and uh, I was having a conversation with somebody else actually uh, Dave Thompson a really good friend of mine uh, one of Paul Dye's senior guys um, 
uh, he encouraged me to write my own book. And I uh, was hesitant and talked to him many conversations and he was very uh, encouraging. And so I went down that path and, uh, and that's kind of how it began. Thank you so much for that question. Let's go over to one of my favorite guys. Let's go to uh, Senior Master of the Arts, Mr. Chuck Sullivan. Chuck. One of my favorite, one of my favorite guys, too. Hello, Chuck. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Todd, how you doing, pal? Good, sir. How about you? Fantastic. You know, I, I started your book, and I tried. I really tried. And <laughs> I think what happens is... You know, they all say you can't teach old dogs new tricks. They not make many dogs much older than I am. <laughs> so this is, this is a real old dog. And, you know, what happened with me was for the first four years till I got my black belt, I was a student of Ed Parker. Just Ed Parker. And then a little cross-training with Jimmy Woo until that whole thing blew up. And then, and then for the next five years, I was partners with Ed Parker. And so he was my, my main source of everything. And back in those days, Ed had a saying. He said, to hear is to disbelieve. To see is to be deceived. Feeling is believing. And that's the way he taught. Yep. And he would make you feel it, or he would allow you to feel it, to a degree. And, that, and then he, well, with he and I, anyhow, uh, I would do it back on him. And he'd say, no, no, you don't quite have, no, ah, that's it, that's it. And that's, that's how I learned. And... Uh, God, I, I tell you, I really wish that I had the, the wherewithal to grasp everything you're saying. <laughs> because I think if you're a student today coming up under this kind of education, it's going to be much more complete. Uh, we still go back to the old, uh, you know, feeling is believing. So God bless you and, uh, and, and keep doing what you're doing because I think it's a, a real asset to the people starting now, but uh, trying to capture some of us old dogs. Good luck on that. Yes, sir. Well, I, I you know, I, first of all, I, I so much appreciate, very humbling, thank you. Um, but I, I always never pass up an opportunity to help somebody believe through feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Solomon. It's really a pleasure to see you. God bless you. Let's go thank to you, Mary. Sir. Mary, are you there? Can you say hello to, to Todd Durgan? And there you go. Yes, I can. Hello. How Todd. you doing, Mary? Hey, it's good to hear from you, Mr. Durgan. It's been too long. Good to see you. Good to see you. I know. We're going to have to figure out a way to get together sometime. Right. Um, uh, kind of going on with what Mr. Sullivan said in, and reading, reading the book, of course. Um, you put a lot of detail into it and you had to to keep the terminology consistent and everything else but that can be overwhelming when you first read it and you'd mention Start writing it yeah um yes <laughs> have you thought about um now doing it more of a uh video style using uh the modern computer technology because a lot of a lot of the um levers the, the classes it's easier when you can see a visual you haven't there. been to my channel. You haven't been to my Kempo Guy Productions channel on YouTube, have you? And I've, it's been a while. I have been there. I haven't seen anything. Re I have not gone recently. Uh, so, recently. so, and this is and this is for everybody's benefit. I actually started implementing and and employing uh, uh, video and computer graphic overlay on my video. So I have uh, the first three, actually the first six of the. Uh, I see Mr. Hildebrandt's laughing over there. Um, I have the first six uh, where I go through a in basic introduction to the three classes of levers, and then uh, in the second three uh, where I actually utilize the overlay as I'm employing the lever or leverage uh, nice. with, on the video. Yes. So, yes, to answer your question, awesome. it's one of the reasons that book two is such a monumental task because um, you know, I, I don't like to set my, I don't like little hurdles. I like hurdles you can't get over. <laughs> Um, and so book two, I, I, you know, I'm encouraged and, and really want to have the QR codes like I put on my posters that go to mm -hmm. YouTube videos. So I want to utilize the QR codes and have video explanations and demonstrations 
of some of those principles and concepts that I talk about in book two. Oh, nice. So you're going for the whole, the whole giant uh, grand the, slam. The whole enchilada. Yep. Want the whole enchilada. But, you know, like I said, yeah, it was 14 years for book one. So don't hold your breath. No, and I know how hard you worked on book one uh, and how much effort you put into it because that was a lot of time and a lot of love, a lot of love. Yes, but I, I love the fact that to see you working on the new technology because that I, I think that is just going to, as far as the feeling is the best way to do it, but at least if you can see it now with some of the other stuff, it really enhances the learning, at least mentally for uh, a lot of people. Right. Yep. Thank you, Mary. Let's go over to Robert. Robert Ashmore, how are you, sir? Say hello Fine. to Todd Durgan. Fine, thanks. Mr. Durgan. Mr. Ashmore, how are you, sir? I'm fine, sir. Thank you. Um, you touched a little bit on um, David Jurvin and his tie. And then we've been talking about the levers and PKI, but you really haven't talked about sequence rescripting. <laughs> And and I and I know that's a whole other you know it'll it it is but it offers an option right of of a different level of pain compliance or breaks uh, within the same flow of a technique but it just rescripts it for um, if you would like to continue with that I would I I All think right. it'd be of interest yeah so so I'll give a quick. Uh, for everybody here um, and and I do actually have a short video where I talk about rescripting uh, was in a seminar at Mr. Rainey's studio um, where I kind of go through that in a little 10 minute segment um, re so sequence rescripting is like I said earlier it's in uh, ch chapter 7 of my book I talk about um, changing the definition or the meaning of motion and, the, and, and Mr. Parker uses this all the time where he says, well, you, you know, a block can be a block or a, block can be a strike or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that same idea applies to the actual, an actual sequence of motion where, uh, you know, if, if, in a real simple example would be a pullback hand. So, I, so a pullback hand is a very simple uh, move or motion action. And in the context of sequence rescripting though, we can change that pullback hand or the, or the meaning of that can change from being in front of us and pulling it back to somebody behind us. And if we execute that pullback hand with vigor, it now becomes a back horizontal elbow. Or if I use that pullback hand, I grab somebody's wrist as in B1A, that pullback hand now becomes a, a different, it has, now it has a different meaning or it has a different purpose. So ultimately that's what sequence rescripting is. I, that's on a very rudimentary level uh, of, of what it is. And I have, you know, where I go through self-defense techniques in their entirety and redefine the entire sequence of motion into joint locking, manipulation, control, and attainment. Thank you, sir, for, uh, we really appreciate it. Let's go to Sam. Sam, unmute yourself. Say hello to some, uh, say hello to Mr. Uh, Durkin, please. Mr. Ibrahim. Hello, sir, how are you? Hello, hey, everyone. Good. good to see everybody. Good to see you, buddy. All right, I'll try to keep my question short. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Info. Durgan, how do you teach the transitions from the locks, especially in cases where you have to escalate beyond the joint lock? Do you use the planes and the resequencing to um, escalate the force? And is there a particular way that you teach that, especially with uh, transitioning from one lever to another lever? So that's a good question. One of the most important things about transitioning from one lock to another lock, and, and, and so there are multiple ways to do this. And if you look in the terminology that I put in the back of my book, uh, I talk about sequential locking where we may go from a finger lock to a finger and a wrist lock and a finger and a wrist lock and an elbow lock or vice versa. And so understanding how to move up or down a, a limb, uh, acquiring new locks and holds all along the way is a very important element. But to answer your question, the transitioning from one lock to another lock or positioning uh, is taught through the use of um, off balancing and changing our opponent's position. So if we have a difficult opponent, the first thing we need to do is, is change their mindset 
for their uh, their purpose. Okay, and that means that if if I have a if I have a a, a, a wrist lock, let's say I have a simple wrist lock like twisted twig, and they drop in to do twisted twig, the first thing I'm going to do is change the angle of that wrist lock and change the purpose of their mind to go from attacking or defending against me to maintaining their balance or their stance. Okay. So it takes them off of me and puts it back to them. And now I have an opportunity to move into whatever it is that I cared to do to them. Beautiful. That Thank you so much on that, Todd. Let's go over to Ruben. Ruben, are you there? Can you say hello? Hello, Mr. Durgan. Mr. Ruben, how are you, buddy? <laughs> Good. Got a question for you. This is regards uh -huh. to this, the sphere. Uh -huh. In regards to the sphere, and my... I believe you're in the center of the sphere when you're doing everything, correct? Correct. Okay, so how would that work if you have an opponent which is outside of the sphere? Would you put him in a, a sphere until both of you guys come together to meet those angles to become one? Or would you move through manipulation? Or does the, the sphere stay in place when the opponent comes into it? or does it move with you? Okay, so your universal pattern or your sphere that's around you is always yours and they have their own. And there is always, and this is where, this is where conflict comes in, right? When your two spheres meet and then they intertwine, okay? And so it's that intertwining of those, uh, that universal pattern or those spheres as you like to call them, those planes as I will call them, okay? That's where the action happens, okay, is when his and mine or hers and mine meet or intersect. Does that make sense? But okay. would that, and if you're doing that, does the center of the sphere move or does yes. it have? Okay. It, it always stays on you. Your spine is the center of that universal pattern always. Okay, okay. so you reference. When I reference a plane, it is referenced to line of sight. Okay. okay. Not like the clock principle in my world, anyway. The clock principle starts, let's say we're doing a, 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 a long form one, right? We start with a citation, we're at 12 o'clock. We go into our first two blocks, boom, 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 we change angles, we're off to what? Nine o'clock. Okay. 12 o'clock's over here. When I move in, when I'm in my, when I have that sphere around me or the universal pattern and those planes, they are always on me in the directional line of sight. Does that make sense? Okay, so will you use his sphere to merge yours to be in sync to get more power? Or uh -huh. does it matter? Yeah, well, matter. that's only so. So you're talking if you're talking about more power, we're just talking. Then you then then separate the sphere idea and work in and move into you know you talk about power generation or the clash or synchronicity of movement and action, right? Mm -hmm. Where as he moves in, I off I step off, or as he moves in, I redirect and I catch him coming in, and I utilize uh, now I can follow on a number one plane, I can use a number six plane, a number nine plane, and do all of that. But the sphere has less to do with our interaction other than angles of reference and so forth. Make no mistake in this, and I, and I, and I meant to say this in the beginning for anybody that ever watches this video. This is not something that you want to think about in combat. This is a teaching tool meant to aid beginners, intermediate, advanced, whoever in better understanding and applying angular, linear, circular motion and referencing directions, angles, dimension, right? And, and better understanding how that interaction happens with our opponent or our partner. Thank okay. you, Ruben. Let's go over to Max Dojo. Unmute yourself, sir. Say hello to uh, Mr. Durgan. This is Durgan. How's it going, sir? Pleasure How to you meet you. How you doing? I haven't Larry seen you in a long Gaika. time, actually. Actually, I met, we met years ago when you were running the studio in Pasadena. Yes, yes. Mr. Casey, thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to, to oh, see no you problem. and we're glad everyone else that's on here. You know, uh, always great to see 
everyone, you know, the Kempo, this is like one big Kempo family. I love it. I think it's good stuff, you know, and the universal pattern's always been a mystery. I mean, it's always been something that's like, you can expand on profoundly just, uh, you know, you, I, I was talking to uh, Mr. Hildebrand earlier today and it's like an onion, you, you know, you have different levels of understanding the universal pattern and he's the one who actually told me you, you should get on this thing today because you know, we're talking about it today. And I was like, I definitely want to get on it. So my, my big thing is you were talking about leveraging. Is it four classes of lever or three? I, I, I think three. I was missing something there. There are three classes of lever with four elements. Okay. So every, every class of lever has four elements. There are, so in, in any application of leverage, there are four elements, right? There are, there's a lever, the action, the load, and the axis. And those are the four elements that are required regardless to, be, or to have a true application of leverage. And this is a discussion that, that uh, and I'll say discussion, that I had with uh, uh, one Ron Chappelle at one point in time long, long ago. We'll just talk about that. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, and so, yeah, there are three classes, but with those three classes, and this is, this is really cool. So if I, if, if I want to geek out on Kempo here and Ed Parker's terminology, we can say that we have, we can say we have one class of lever, right? and two other rearrangements, okay? Because leverage and levers are really just the rearrangement concept. Does that make sense? Correct, yes. See, I go, I actually Googled it to make sure, like, am I missing something? I'm like, think it, and, and you know, it shows like pictures of leveraging online where you can kind of get an idea of how the leverage works. And so, to me, I, so I kind of am familiar with that. I'm, I'm like, um, I'm the, I'm the type of guy that has to do, feel it, do it over and over, and then I do the reverse engineering to where it's like, oh, that's what they were talking about. So 10 years later, I'm gonna go, that's what Mr. Durgan was talking about after right. I've gone through this whole process of you know trying to figure it out and just get the feel of it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I know that, for example, leveraging is only on a joint manipulation, is only as good as the pain compliance works because for example, my elbow, I've snapped my elbow and completely bent it backwards. And uh, I think just when I was a younger kid and I think mm -hmm. I got up and I went to dust myself off and my arm just did a complete circle that was, was going the wrong direction. And Yikes. so when I, went to, when I went to pick my arm up, this was folded completely down. And I think during the adrenaline, there was just no pain. I didn't feel anything. The pain must have been just right before it broke but I know that when you do have pain compliance it, it it's only to a certain point before you actually break something correct, uh, or something to that point you know and so yeah I, I just think you got a lot of great stuff going on and a lot of good information so, so it's funny, funny you say this because not, 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 when, when I came up in Pasadena it was called the rearrangement concept and then it that it later on evolved in uh, Mr. Parker's books to the equation formula. And I, what I think Todd is doing is he's taking that and showing how it applies. He's not really taking and removing Kempo. He's just expanding on it and adding to it. Am I correct on that, Todd? Yes. See, so for those of you who are worrying about the, is this a whole completely new system? No, it's a new way of thinking. And it's way it does is it helps you to understand these principles of motion this motion that mr parker was talking about to flush it out so you can understand it in a better way different metaphors and we're very visual some of us can see things some of us feel things some people read things and some people just sit there and go huh and then we listen to things <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's, that's where that's we're me. at with I'm it. The like guy. Said, we are very happy that you're on here asking these questions because Todd is an amazing source of information on this. And this is, again, the future of Campo growing, as Mr. Parker wanted it to be, a thinking man's system. So, Mr. Kungaika, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Absolutely. You know, interestingly enough, you, you mentioned that it's only as good as the, as the compliance you can achieve. And that's absolutely correct. And I'll tell you a quick story. I have a, one of my black belts is Hawaiian, okay, which I believe you are, correct? Okay. And... It, okay, either way, so he has 
I think zero pain receptors. He does not feel pain. Um, I've had this guy, I had him in a wrist lock. I was demonstrating some technique and I had him in a, in a wrist lock and, and I, you know, and, I, and it felt to me like it was going to break. And I right, asked right. Dominic, I said, doesn't that hurt? And he looked at me and he kind of looked at his wrist and he said, no, Mr. Dirty, it doesn't hurt. It feels like it's going to break, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> like, oh my God. So what am I going to do with a guy like that? You know? Wow. So, right. So, and so this, you know, so we get back to, okay, so what can I use? And this is a tool in your tool bag, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great tool mm -hmm. for 98% of the people. Look, Kempo was designed for a right-handed person. Not everybody in the world is right-handed. I'm left-handed, but I learned Kempo as a right, you know, it's a right-handed system. I, but guess what that gives me? I have yeah. many more tools now because I am left-handed. Right. So it, it again, it's another tool in the toolbox. And if we look at things like force continuum, uh, you know, pain compliance and all of those things, you know, look, you can, you can bash somebody's skull out, kick them in the side of the head and drop them on the ground and end up in jail for the next 10 years for manslaughter. Right. Or you can try to exercise and execute pain compliance techniques and minimize or mitigate what your responsibility is well I, I was always told if it doesn't work one way you flip it around and it works the opposite so i mean if, if you know they may be this way may not hurt them but you flip it the other way and tweak it and so but that's not always but that's not always true of people that just don't have pain receptors true, some people that's true disconnected like from here down <laughs> So thank you so very much for all those questions. We look forward to seeing you at the next uh, uh, Zoom meeting. Thank you very much for coming today. It was truly an honor to have Todd with us. And I'm telling you, you could have a series with Todd all day long. And so, Mr. Durgan, continue success. Always a pleasure to listen to you. And if you have any questions, please reach out to him directly. And with that, sir, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. And thanks nice everybody for coming. I greatly appreciate your time. And because uh, I know time is an investment. Thanks Great so much for having Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is Paul Casey of Campbell Karate Hall of Fame. God bless y'all. Take care. Be safe. Great book. Great book.